Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Really, the applause should not be for me this evening. I am the rector of the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to our final keynote uh, of the Vienna Humanities Festival 2023. And it's a particular pleasure because this evening we are also welcoming, welcoming in the audience the Federal President of the Republic of Austria, Alexander van der Bellen. Welcome. Uh, in a minute, uh, we will welcome onto the stage our keynote speaker, and after he's given his, his uh, speech, he will be in conversation with the permanent fellow from the Institute of Human Sciences, Ivan Krastev. But before I invite our guest onto the stage, I would like to thank the people who have made this possible, namely the City of Vienna, the Erste Foundation, uh, Falter Magazine. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Open Society Foundation. And I'd like to thank the Academy of Fine Arts, where tomorrow we have day two of the main program of the Humanities Festival. And you can see another variety of really stimulating, uh, stimulating talks. And thank you very much also to the Volkstheater for uh, hosting uh, this evening. Uh, we're very proud of the Humanities Festival and I want to make a special mention here of all the people at the EVM, at the Institute for Human Sciences, who've put in so much time and effort to make a real success uh, of this program. But now I wish to welcome on stage the uh, Professor of Political Philosophy at Harvard, uh, I'm not going to enumerate his, his, his talents, his awards, his books, because we'd be here all night. His latest book is The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming onto the stage Michael Sandel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Thank you very much. Mr. President, my colleagues and friends at the Institute for Human Studies, ladies and gentlemen, what an honor it is to be here at this festival. When I arrived in Vienna yesterday and contemplating, was contemplating this gathering, uh, memories came flooding back of some of the happy and stimulating times that I spent in Vienna uh, thanks to the activities of the Institute for Human Studies, the IWM, and my dear friend Krzysztof Michalski, the first rector and the founding <laughs> rector. And I hope it was running through my mind. I hope he would have approved, uh, given at least his wry approval, to the argument I would like to put before you, which is about, which is about merit. And we'll see if this, this, okay, this can pick me up so I can walk in and see you. The tyranny of merit. It's paradoxical on its face to speak of merit as a kind of tyranny, because normally we think of merit as a good thing. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. That's merit. If I'm flying in an airplane, I want a well-qualified pilot at the controls. Merit filling important social roles with people well qualified to perform them. That's a good thing. So how could merit become a kind of tyranny? That's what I'd like to put to you tonight. 
to explain how this can happen, and I believe has happened, we need to look back over the past four or five decades. During this time, the last half century really, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth, but it's not only that. It has also to do with the changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the rising inequalities. Those who've landed on top during this age of globalization, those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the full bounty that the market bestows upon them, and by implication, they come, perhaps we come, to view those who struggle as lacking merit, as we tend to look, look upon those who struggle and say their failure must be their fault. This way of thinking about success is the harsh side, the dark side, of a seemingly attractive ideal, the ideal of meritocracy, the principle that says, insofar as chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, in practice, we know, we don't live up to that ideal. We don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. Children born poor in our societies tend to stay poor as adults. It isn't easy to rise. We in the United States, above all, have long said to ourselves, have comforted ourselves with the following thought. Yes, we have deep inequalities, traditionally deeper inequalities than European democracies, but we have long told ourselves, in America, we don't have to worry so much about inequality, not as much as those European societies, because in America, we have mobility. No one is consigned to the fate of their birth. In America, we have mobility, upward mobility, the possibility of rising. Mobility was our answer to inequality. Problem is that at least these days, mobility is not an answer to inequality. A certain degree of equality is a necessary condition for upward mobility. Today, there is greater upward mobility, one generation to the next, in many European countries, especially northern European countries, than there is in the United States. The OECD did a study asking the following question. At current rates of intergenerational upward mobility, how long would it take for someone born to a low-income family to rise, not to the top, but to the median in their society? In Denmark, it takes two generations. In the United States, and also in Austria, it takes five generations, from which one might conclude that the American dream is alive and well and living in Copenhagen. <laughs> so today, greater equality is a condition of rising, especially at a time when the opportunity to rise is closely tied to access to university education. Affluent parents 
have figured out how to pass their privilege onto their kids. And these days, the way they do that is to equip their kids to be competitive in the meritocratic tournament that uh, has, uh, has come to surround, to attend, the application for selective universities, especially in, in the United States and in Britain. In, but the, there's a general problem, and it tracks education with, in it, with uh, not living up to the meritocratic principles we profess in Europe as well. Children whose parents did not complete secondary school in Europe have only a 15% chance of making it to university, compared to a 60% chance for their peers with at least one parent with a degree. And it's not only a matter of educational disadvantage that persists. The educational divide has a bearing even on how long people live. In Europe, as a, in the OECD, I should say, as a whole, a 25-year-old university-educated man can expect to live eight years longer than his less educated peer. Among women, interestingly, it's not eight years, but 4.6 years. So there is a difference. So it's clear that opportunities are not equal, that it's not easy to rise. And so one might conclude that the problem with meritocracy is simply that we haven't achieved it. And the solution is simply to double down on the meritocratic ethic, to try to bring about a more genuine, a more truly fair and full equality of opportunity. But that would not be enough or at least that's the idea I would like to put to you tonight. The problem with meritocracy is not only that we fail to live up to it. The ideal itself has a dark side. And the dark side is this. Meritocracy, even a perfectly realized meritocracy, is corrosive of the common good. And that's because it leads to hubris among the winners and to humiliation for those who lose out. Meritocracy encourages the successful to inhale too deeply of our own success, to forget the luck and good fortune that help us on our way, to forget our indebtedness to those who make our achievements possible. And it leads the successful to look down on those less fortunate than themselves because of the harsh, demanding, thoroughgoing notion of individual responsibility on which it rests. One of the most <coughs> potent sources of the populist backlash against elites, especially against credentialed elites, is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them. And this grievance, this grievance, is a legitimate complaint. And until elites, but more broadly, mainstream center left and center right parties notice this feature of their moral and political project, it will be very difficult to contend with and to overcome the danger to democracy posed by the right-wing populist backlash against elites, that this way of thinking about success and this way of organizing the economy have created. Now, this case against meritocracy, noticing the dark side, noticing the harsh attitudes towards success, 
was, was made, was articulated, surprisingly, you may think, by the person who put the term meritocracy into common parlance. His name was Michael Young. He was a British sociologist affiliated with the Labor Party. In 1958, he wrote a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. It was not a celebration of meritocracy. We valorize the term. We conceive meritocracy, for the most part, as an ideal to aspire to. But Michael Young, who coined the term, saw it as a kind of dystopia. He wrote at a time when the British class system after the war was breaking down. Finally, young people from working class backgrounds could, at least in many cases, compete, get a good education and compete for jobs with young people from the privileged classes. And that was a good thing. Michael Young was, was in favor of that. But what he noticed, what he, glimpsed, what he glimpsed and foresaw was that as the meritocracy advanced, it would cultivate attitudes toward success of the kind that I've been describing. And he saw this as a danger. He saw it as a danger because it would rationalize and justify and make more intractable inequalities of income and wealth that would persist. Not only that, he predicted in his little dystopian book, Michael Young did, that eventually, he said in the year 2034, there would be a populist backlash that would overthrow the meritocracy. He was right about that, except that the revolt occurred 18 years before he predicted. Now, how does this connect with our experience of the past four or five decades? Even as the meritocratic way of thinking about success gained prominence in public discourse, the neoliberal globalization project brought widening inequality. These two things unfolded at, roughly speaking, the same time. And they're connected. They're connected because, well, it's as if the winners of globalization wanted more than the winnings. They wanted to believe that they deserved the outsized share of income and wealth that four decades of deregulation, financialization, and neoliberal economic <coughs> policies brought them. This wanting to deserve advantage, the benefits that go with landing on top, this is a long-standing impulse that reaches back before the age of the market faith and of the meritocratic faith. Max Weber noticed it a century ago. The fortunate person is seldom satisfied with the fact of being fortunate, Weber wrote. Beyond this, he needs to know that he has a right to his good fortune. He wants to be convinced that he deserves it. And above all, that he deserves it in comparison with others. He wishes to be allowed the belief that the less fortunate also merely experience their due. This is the tyranny of merit. It arises in part from this impulse. Now, the impulse goes back even further than 100 years. Today's secular meritocratic order moralizes success in ways that echo an earlier providential faith, going all the way back to early Christian debates about salvation. Some of the most fraught and interesting 
theological debates in the history of Christianity involved the question of whether salvation was earned a matter of merit, a response by God, a favorable response by God to my good works and my faith, or whether salvation is unrelated to what I've done, entirely unearned, a matter of God's grace, a gift of grace. So the dialectic of merit and grace, of earning and deserving on the one hand, and being the recipient of a gift on the other, this tension, this dialectic, goes back a very long way. Today's, in, in our secular society, so we moralize success in the same way those who wanted to, the, the Puritans, you find this in the Puritans, who, who say that uh, worldly success winds up being not just a sign of salvation, but a source of salvation. And this, this remains deeply influential. Today, we don't so much make this argument about salvation, but we do make this argument about worldly success. And the ultimate claim for which the meritocratic attitude towards success reaches with regard to worldly success is the idea that at least insofar as chances were equal, the rich are rich because they are more deserving than the poor. That's the ultimate logic. This way of thinking heightens the moral stakes of economic competition. It sanctifies the winners, and it denigrates the losers. Now, as a political matter, let's now come back to the last roughly four decades. As a political matter, the main project of mainstream center-right and center-left political parties and politicians over the last 40 or 50 years has been to clear obstacles for advancement so that everyone, regardless of their background, will be able to rise as far as their efforts and talents will take them. You've heard this slogan. We've heard it from politicians across the political spectrum to the point of incantation almost. And this, I call this the rhetoric of rising. Everyone, whatever their background, should be able to rise as far as their talents and effort will take them. Despite its seemingly egalitarian bent, the rhetoric of rising entrenched rather than challenged inequalities of income and wealth because it didn't propose to address these inequalities by reconsidering the economic policies that produced them. Instead, it offered a workaround, mobility. More precisely, individual upward mobility through higher education. To workers frustrated by decades of stagnant wages and outsourced jobs, the mainstream political figures and parties of the last four or five decades offered some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. These were the familiar slogans. And we heard them in, in the United States, in Britain, and in social democracies of Europe. What these politicians missed was the insult implicit in this bracing advice. The insult was this. If you don't have a university degree and if you're struggling 
in the new economy, your failure must be your fault. We told you so. Improve yourself. Get a university degree. So it's no wonder that many working people turned against meritocratic elites. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credential can easily forget a simple fact. Most of our fellow citizens don't have a university degree. Not in the United States, not in Britain, not in Europe. Only a, roughly a third, a little more than a third in the United States, have a four-year degree. And in Britain and Europe, the figures are roughly similar. The majority do not. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as the necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life, a university degree that most people don't have. So what to do about this? If meritocratic attitudes towards success have deepened the divide between winners and losers, if individual mobility through higher education is too feeble a response to inequalities of income and wealth, if the rhetoric of rising has become, for many, less a promise than a taunt, what should we do? Well, we need to change the terms of public discourse, and we need to change our way of thinking about inequality, and more broadly, our way of thinking about politi the political economy. We should begin by acknowledging that mobility cannot compensate for inequality. Any serious response to the gap between the rich and the rest must reckon directly with inequalities of power and wealth rather than rest content with the project of helping people scramble up a ladder whose rungs grow further and further apart. This means shifting the terms of public discourse. We should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on affirming the dignity of work. This means, and now different, different politicians and political parties will have different conceptions of how to realize the dignity of work, but that would be a different kind of debate than the debate about how to boost people in the competition to scramble up the ladder of success. We should ask what policies would ensure that people who don't inhabit the privileged ranks of the professional classes and of the credentialed classes, how can the rest of our citizens find work that enables them to support a family and to contribute to their community and to win social recognition and esteem for doing so. One consequence of the credentialist tide is that the working class, people without a, a university degree, is now virtually absent from representative government. We don't often pause and notice this fact. In the United States, about half the labor force is employed in what are classified as working class jobs, but fewer than 2% of members of Congress worked in such jobs before their election. And if we look at the representation of those without university degrees in the parliaments of Europe, we see something similar. In European societies where about two-thirds of citizens do not have degrees, virtually none of them are members of parliament, only about eight to 10%, depending on the country. 
are present as members of parliament. So we need to pay attention to this and we need to take account of the politics of anger and humiliation and resentment. The, the politics, the political appeal of the right-wing populist figures such as Donald Trump who have exploited these grievances have, in addition to exploiting those grievances, have advanced political appeals wrapped up in racism and misogyny and xenophobia. That's true. But it's too easy, especially for center-left parties, to say, oh, that's all about racism and xenophobia, and to dismiss, to dismiss it without making a serious attempt to disentangle from those ugly sentiments the legitimate grievances with which they are entangled. That's not easy to do. But figuring out how to do it and figuring out how to address the legitimate grievances will be one of the central challenges if the, those of us who are worried about the future of democracy are to contend with this very deep and persisting sense of grievance and anger and resentment. Now, all of this suggests that the project of assuring more equal, more genuine equality of opportunity is not good enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Nobody should be held back by poverty or prejudice. But a good society can't be premised only on the promise of escape, of rising. Focusing only or mainly on rising does little to cultivate the social bonds and civic attachments that democracy requires. Even a society more successful than ours at providing upward mobility would need to find ways to enable those who do not rise to flourish in place and to see themselves as members of a common project. It's often assumed that the only alternative to equality of opportunity is a sterile, oppressive equality of results. But there's another alternative. The other alternative is to seek a broad equality of condition that enables those who do not achieve great wealth or prestigious positions to live lives of decency and dignity, developing and exercising their abilities in work that wins social esteem that enables everyone to share in a widely diffused culture of learning and to deliberate with their fellow citizens about public affairs. As I was coming to the end of writing my book, The Tyranny of Merit, I could already anticipate the objection that some might raise, the challenge, the question, does this mean giving up on the American dream? After all, isn't the American dream about mobility, about individual mobility, about rising? I went back and I looked at the text that introduced the term the American dream. It was in a book written by James Truslow Adams, his name was, in the 1930s, in the midst of the Depression. And it turns out that what he meant by the American dream was not only about moving up 
That was part of it. It was also about achieving what I have called a broad democratic equality of condition. And he gave an example, a concrete example, pointing to the US Library of Congress, a symbol, he said, of what democracy can accomplish on its own behalf, a place of public learning that drew Americans from all walks of life. Here's how he put it. As one looks down on the general reading room, one sees the seats filled with silent readers. Old and young, rich and poor, black and white, the executive and the laborer, the general and the private, the noted scholar and the schoolboy, all reading at their own library provided by their own democracy. Adams considered this scene to be the perfect working out in a concrete example of the American dream the means provided by the resources of the people themselves and a public intelligent enough to use them. And he concluded by saying, if this example could be carried out in all departments of our national life, the American dream would become an abiding reality. These days in our societies, we do not have much equality of condition. Public spaces that gather people together across class and race and ethnicity and faith are few and far between. Those who are affluent and those of modest means rarely encounter one another in the course of the day. We live and work and shop and play in separate places. We send our children to different schools and when the meritocratic sorting machine has done its work, those on top find it hard to resist the thought that they deserve their success and that those on the bottom deserve their place too. But this feeds a politics so poisonous and a partisanship so intense that many now regard marriage across, marriage across party lines as more troubling than marrying outside the faith. This is the achievement of the age of meritocracy. It's little wonder that we've lost the ability to reason together about large public questions or even to listen to one another. The meritocratic conviction that people deserve whatever riches the market bestows on their talents, makes solidarity an almost impossible project. For why do the successful owe anything to the less advantaged members of society? The answer to this question depends on recognizing that for all our striving, we are not self-made and self-sufficient. Finding ourselves in a society that prizes our talents, that's our good fortune, not our due. A lively sense of the contingency of our lot, of the role of luck in life, of our indebtedness for our achievements, all of this can inspire a certain humility. The humility that inclines us to say, there but for the grace of God or the accident of birth or the mystery of fate, go I. That could be me. This spirit of humility is the civic virtue we need now. It's the beginning of the way back from the harsh ethic of success that drives us apart. Perhaps it can point us beyond the tyranny of merit toward a less rancorous, more generous public life. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Before listening to the lecture and before reading the book, I was going to say that Professor Sandel deserves his applauses, but now I'm afraid of the word. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I just want to make one point before we start the conversation, because you have an Institute for Advanced Studies who basically has invited one of the symbols of academic meritocracy, somebody who basically achieved because of knowledge and so uh, Professor at Harvard, basically a person that he has millions of people viewing uh, his lectures, who comes and said, meritocracy is a problem, is an ideal. Not simply that meritocracy yeah. is not what we see and what we call meritocracy. And I'm saying this because it's a very radical message. And, and in order to illustrate it, in 1997, during the British debate when Tony Blair came to power, they have been debating <sighs> with the leader of the Conservative Party back then, John Major, and one of the questions was, what are the three priorities for your next government? And Tony Blair said, I have three priorities. Education, education, education. And then George Ma uh, John Major said, I have the same three, but in a different order. <laughs> uh, why I'm saying why this is so important? Because in a certain way, till yesterday we believed that education is solution to all of the social problems. And what basically Professor Sandel has argued very powerfully that education could be the problem itself. So my first question is, when you're arguing this, you said this is the problem of Christian society, which now is secularized. Yeah. This is the problem of democracy. This is the problem of capitalism. But first, what I remember from my early days in Bulgaria before 1989, if there was a popular dream, to be honest, I don't know to what extent it was about democracy, but it was about meritocracy. Everybody wanted to be governed by people who are not simply a party loyalists, but basically who have some competence that basically deserves what they're doing. Secondly, if you look at China, the idea of the meritocracy is as popular as in the United States. So my first question to you is, to what extent basically the utopia of meritocracy is not the common utopia of any modernity. And this is to what extent this is just specific for our own democratic capitalist societies and to what extent basically it crosses borders and if the differences, where are the differences? Well, first, thank you. And I want to say what I, uh, because Ivan wasn't formally introduced, but it's such a privilege to be in conversation with Ivan Krastev, from whom I've learned an enormous amount about politics every time I read anything he writes. So thank you for, for joining in this conversation, Ivan. First, on... <laughs> yeah. And we also, we also go, go back a long way with the uh, Institute for Human... Uh, this I should tell studies. you because this is something about the biography of yeah. Professor Sandel that you don't know. When uh, Professor Michalski died, as you can imagine, for the Institute, the death of the founding director was a major crisis. Many people were asking the question, could it survive? And then Professor Sandel agreed to be a co-rector for a while in order to insert basically confidence, also in the staff, in the colleagues, that it is going to work. And there was one other person that was, by the way, critically important for the Institute at this moment. And this was Alexander Van der Bellen, who back then was not a president. <laughs> so. <laughs> On education, education, education. I too am in, in, in favor of education. Encouraging young people to, get a, to go to university is a good thing. Uh, making it possible for those without the financial means to do so is even better. I've devoted my career to education, so I'm not against it. I come out in favor of education, and I don't think that's a controversial position. But to regard education as the solution to the inequalities brought about 
by a market-driven economy is a mistake. And so that, I want to make clear, is the, is the case I make, not against education, but against conscripting education, and especially higher education, into serving as the arbiter of opportunity for a market-driven meritocratic society. I think this is what's been very deeply damaging uh, because we've cast universities, uh, higher education, uh, these are the institution that define the merits and confer the credentials that a market-driven meritocracy prizes and rewards. And this, in effect, has turned universities into sorting machines for a meritocratic society. And that's not only, that only, not only makes things hard for those who don't get in, which is what I emphasized in the talk, it's also though it heightens the economic and political and cultural centrality of universities, it's bad for higher education because gradually the, the sorting mission, the credentializing mission of universities is driving out our educational mission, the intrinsic purposes that universities should serve, which is not to pick out winners for consulting firms or for hedge funds or for law firms. That's not, that's not what education ideally is for. It's to invite young people, as many as possible, to reflect on what's worth caring about and why, and to reflect on fundamental human purposes and ends, and to cultivate the love of learning, not to be sorting machines. So, Conscripting higher education for this purpose is not only politically corrosive of solidarity and generating of resentments, but it's corrosive of the intrinsic goods that higher education should be pursuing. So that's on education. As far as meritocracy being a kind of defining feature of an aspiration of modernity, well, it is in a way, it is in a way, but it goes back really to pre-modern times. You mentioned the Chinese love of meritocracy, which has two strands, and it's important to distinguish them. China has a long uh, history of meritocracy uh, that that goes back to the Confucian ethic that the, the virtuous uh, uh, scholars should have influence in governing. And it, goes, it, it informed the early civil service exams in China. Today in China, the love of meritocracy comes very close to, to another strand, which is bound up with a market meritocracy, which is very close to what we, we have in Western democracy, capitalist democracies and what I was describing. But there's an important difference between these two traditions, the more ancient conception of meritocracy, which for us, if we think about the right to rule, we want to be governed by the best. Why not? But for us, when we think about being governed by the best, we tend to define merit as technocratic expertise. There was a famous book by a journalist, David Halberstam, writing about the run-up to the Vietnam War. The brilliant people, the well-credentialed people who John Kennedy uh, brought into his administration and whom Lyndon Johnson inherited. The best and the brightest, he called them. They had technocratic expertise and but, but they lacked political judgment. And they, it, was, it was the best and the brightest in the technocratic sense who brought us the folly of the Vietnam War and who also brought us the folly subsequently of the deregulation of the financial industry and the decision not to regulate derivatives. The best and the brightest measured by academic credentials and prestige, Ivy League credentials. And 
Actually, there's a story in Halberstam's book that draws the distinction between merit as technocratic expertise and merit as grounded human civic political judgment. Shortly after John F. Kennedy took office and appointed this glittering credentialed cabinet, Lyndon Johnson, who came from a, attended a teacher's college in Texas, went to his mentor, also from Texas, Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, and told them how marvelous and brilliant were all of these people. To which Sam Rayburn replied, well, Lyndon, they may be all as smart as you say they are, but I'd feel better if at least one of them had run for sheriff once. <laughs> he understood the dis difference between merit as technocratic expertise and merit as, to go back to the classical formulation, civic virtue, civic excellence. In the Confucian tradition, the best should rule, but what counted as being best was not only being a scholar, but also having virtue. The two went together. And for Plato, in Plato's Republic, the idea is the idea of the philosopher king. The best should rule. But the best, he didn't mean the experts should rule. He thought those, and Aristotle, uh, from a different angle, thought that those greatest in civic excellence should rule. But that was a conception of merit that involved virtue, qualities of character that had to be cultivated, the ability to identify with one's fellow citizens and to deliberate with, even as one leads, one fellow citizens about the common good. So, as a dream of modernity, I think these two different strands of meritocracy became entangled, and part of what I think we need to do is to disentangle them, to be more critical of uh, technocratic expertise and more attentive to, well, civic virtue. This, this is a great point, because one of the things that you have in the book, you didn't touch on the lecture, which was also very well argued by your colleague from Yale, uh, 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 basically, Daniel Markovitz is the following. We know now that meritocracy produces inequality, is not solving it, that it is very bad to be a loser in the meritocratic game. But what he's also arguing is that, in a certain way, the winners of meritocratic game starts to hate meritocracy. And let's give you one example. As you know, it's not difficult to know how long the top lawyers in the United States are working because they're billing you for this. Uh, and as a result of it, he figured out that basically, on a weekly base, the time they have been working is equal to the time that proletariat work, according to Engels in his famous book, The Working Class in England. So you have a certain type of elite which is not a leisure class anymore. Most of these people work a lot, including bankers. They're getting a lot. And here comes, in my view, the real challenge to any type of a egalitarian ideal. Because the biggest problem of these people is, most of them, by the way, and this is very strongly in your book, most of the people that we are calling rich made their money, not of the money that they inherited, but basically money then earned. And some of them even earned it as a high salary and others. But they're investing this money in order to educate their kids. And here's the problem of any, in my view, egalitarian idea. How you can love all the kids in the world as much as you were loving your own children. Because these people are paying incredible amount of money to be sure that their kids are going to remain part of the elites. Because in order to get to Harvard and other places, it's not simply that basically you should be rich, but you should start to be trained when you're five years old. And there are places like, it's not only America, South Korea is the greatest place. Do you know that in South Korea there is a law where police can check and you don't have right after 10 p.m. to have a private tutor working with the kids? Can you imagine the response to what this was? So I'm asking this because, in my view, this idea of meritocracy not simply producing an angry losers, yeah. but unhappy winners, yes. is something of the debate that was less discussed. Yes. And in my view, this is what I hear coming now, and this is not where, for example, somebody like Young was going to see the problem. Yes, yes. Michael Young didn't notice yeah, this yeah, feature exactly. of it because he didn't fully see what enormous pressure 
this system would place on higher education and the meritocratic tournament it would create and the pressures uh, that are inflicted on the young people who compete in that tournament to win admission. And here, some people have compared, rightly, the aristocratic hierarchy of old with the new aristocracy that meritocracies produce, where the parents at the top do figure out how to pass their privileges onto their children, not today by bequeathing them landed estates or trust funds, but by providing them with the cultural opportunities, the, uh, the SAT prep courses, the cram courses, the, uh, the internships, the uh, opportunity to go do good work in distant places, the better to impress college admissions officers, um, Ivy League sports, which are not only basketball and football, but water polo and squash and fencing, which are sports that help get you in. So the result is that despite generous financial aid policies, in the Ivy League universities. In fact, if your family makes $85,000 or less, you don't pay a cent for tuition or for housing or for food or for books. And at Stanford, if you make, if your family makes 100,000 or less, you don't pay a thing. Despite these generous policies, there are more students in these places from families in the top 1% than from uh, the entire bot bottom half of the country combined. So, but when privilege is passed down, not the old fashioned way with money and land, but the, in the meritocratic way, it exerts a heavy price emotionally and even to the psychological well being of young people because. Young people, we've essentially converted the adolescent years. This is less so in many European countries, but in the US, we've converted the adolescent years into a stress-strewn, anxious, meritocratic gauntlet where young people have to take these advanced placement courses and these SAT PRAM courses and the athletic activities, the extracurriculars. And by the time they arrive, the winners are wounded. And there are unprecedented levels, alarming levels, of mental and emotional health challenges. The university uh, mental health, health facilities have grown but are pressed to their absolute limit because of the enormous emotional pressure and psychological pressure that this way of passing along merit inflicts. So the tyranny of merit is exerted, exerts its oppressive force in two directions, on those who don't get in and on those who do. This is, this is, in my view, politically very, very interesting because you're going to see now a new generation of politicians who are going to hide that they have graduated from a great universities. And one of them, by the way, is Donald Trump. Because when you're looking at him, you believe in the way he talks, that he just comes from a kind of a tough neighborhood. But he comes from one of a very credented uh, business schools of the United States. He comes from Wharton. Uh, and I'm saying this because one of the things when you talk particularly to some of these populist politicians, and this, in my view, try to answer the question how it happened that people who are giving all their money to send their kids to the best universities do not want to be governed by the people who graduate these universities. It, 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 this is a real issue. And the real issue is first, and I, I'm really very much interested on your command, for the meritocratic idea, society looks like a school. You go there, and the best are doing better, and the others are not doing very well, and they deserve it. And Basically, the best students are dating the best boys or girls. 
And this is fair. From the point of view of the populist, society is a family. I basically help you because not you deserve it, but because you are one of us. And secondly, meritocracy creates a level of mobility, but not social mobility up, but also geographical mobility. Mm -hmm. If you're going to graduate from Harvard, you can find a place to work anywhere. So you have an exit. Many of the societies in which you do not have an exit. Uh, during the Greek financial crisis, many basically of the meritocratic Greeks can leave the country. And I do believe this social mobility, but also physical mobility of yeah. the elites scares people. Because if your elite has an exit and you don't have an exit, this makes you very nervous. So this is why I'm very much interested in your idea of what is going to be the response, because the statistics that really shocked me was that at present moment, half of the people in the United States who define themselves as the Republicans claim that they don't want their kids to go to college. But listen, and listen, part of it is also that some of the working class voters move to the Republicans, but some of them are middle class people. And I do believe you told very powerfully why our conversation should come, but now university is the most contested institution in the United States. Yeah. You are there, what you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, in, the short answer is, uh, try to raise these questions with the students who are there and invite them to reflect on, on the circumstance, which is, uh, which is what I've been doing. And, the, and it leads to some searching and fraught discussions among students who, who were brought up to believe it's almost impossible to endure this system and to prevail in it without coming to believe that if you win, if you win admission to a top university, let's say, it's due to your own effort and hard work because growing up, their parents said, your fate will depend on how hard you work, how well you do on these exams, how well, what grades you get. And so it's, they do understand, even kids who don't come from well-off families, they do understand the advantages that they had that enabled them, along with their hard work, to prevail. But it's very hard not to believe that. I, now, I was in high school, my high school years, before the, this intense meritocratic competition took hold. But it was beginning, it was just at the very beginning and I, was, I went to a public high school in Pacific Palisades, California. I tell this story in the book. Do you, do you mind if I... Yeah, yeah you should it? tell it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was in a math class. Now, this was a public high school, though it was in a well-off area. And in the United States, unfortunately, there's enormous inequality in public schools because the funding is from local property tax. So this was a well-financed highly competitive public school with a lot of college-bound students. And when I was, oh, maybe 15, I think, I was in a math class that was, and it was all tracked. So which math class you were in, they had maybe three or four different levels based on testing of various kinds. The result was, the kids in the top classes were always competing with one another and in the same classes as one another. And in this particular math class, after each quiz and each graded exam, each homework assignment, the teacher would announce the new seating arrangement in the classroom. Because for the first three rows, we students were seated based on your grade point average as of that moment as of that quiz in the class. So even before you got back your test, and people were tremulous, wondering, well, how did I do? Even before you saw whether you got an A or a B or a C, you were, the person seated in the first seat is now so-and-so, and in the second seat, I wasn't that great in, I was okay, but not that great in math, so I wasn't, I don't think, in the first seat. 
Now, maybe I was, I was happy if I you know, was in the third or fourth. It was respectable, at least. I was better in other subjects. But if I was, say, in the third seat, maybe I hadn't done so well. Well, now in the third seat, there's someone else. So I had to pick up my stuff and stand up. Well, maybe the next one. No, fourth is somebody else. So there's a kind of public uh, enforcement of this competition. And so not surprisingly, we all learned not only to calculate our own grades to the 100th decimal point, but also to pay attention to other people's. We knew all these people. So by the time of high school, there was this terrible, competitive, distracting ethic. And I was in a biology class. And the biology teacher was of the old school. He wore a bow tie. And his class biology classroom was filled with tanks of animals. There were salamanders. There were lizards and frogs. There were rats and mice. And we could take them home. And there were uh, creatures of every imaginable kind. But students cared most of all about the grades on the tests and the quizzes. And so one day, he said, here's a quiz. Take out a piece of paper and number from 1 to 15 and answer true or false. And the student said, but where are the questions? What do you mean, true or false? He said, well, think of a statement and write down whether it's true or false. <laughs> and the students became very anxious. They said, well, is this going to count? <laughs> and he said, yes, of course, why not? At the time, I just thought it was an, set, an eccentric, amusing kind of classroom joke. But I, in retrospect, as I was writing the book, I realized that in his own way, this biology teacher was, he was trying to get us to step back from the striving and the sorting long enough to marvel at the salamanders. He was, he was enacting his own antidote to the tyranny of merit by introducing at least a moment of luck fortune, chance, and maybe grace. Listen, first, I'm so grateful that I was not in your school. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> uh, but, but, but secondly, what is critically important, because, and you know, in Sweden, there was a moment of Finland, places where the kids, particularly in the early years, they have not been graded at all and so on, and didn't end well too. So it is easy to say that meritocratic principle has this dark side. But it is not easy to be replaced by a principle. And in my view, this is the problem. Because if I decide basically to argue, I can say, listen, what Professor Sandel is telling us, don't aspire much. Enjoy you have. If basically you believe that you're doing manual labor, enjoy it. Uh, and of course, particularly when it comes from the position of meritocratic elites, they can look at try to reduce the competition. And I do believe this is why your dignity story is critically important, mm -hmm. because one of the problems is, and uh, there was a colleague, uh, David Goodhart, who has been in the Institute, is that he claimed that we put so much privilege on the cognitive abilities. Yeah. If you see which is the American institutions in which the poor and the minorities are much more socially mobile, it is not the best university. This is the American army. Because in the American army, it's not everything is cognitive. You have things like physical courage. You have leadership. So from this point of view, probably we should much broader try to basically also value things that are not simply the possibility to do tests. Yeah, yeah. Well, we need one of the practical policy implications of this analysis is that we need to invest more than we do, certainly in relative terms, in vocational and technical training and um, to invest in equipping young people who pursue the trades. And we woefully underinvest in those areas. Germany is somewhat better than uh, the United States in this regard by having uh, taking more seriously vocational and technical training and apprenticeships. But it's not just a matter of money and investment. It's also a matter 
of respect, social recognition, and esteem for people who perform roles and hold jobs that don't require a university credential, we should not assume that those jobs and social roles and the people who perform them are worthy of less respect and that their work uh, is less valued than people who have credentials or professional degrees. And so this, we were talking last night about how um, in the German election this became a theme, at least to try to shift the way in which at least rhetorically, but also ideally in policies and investment, um, to try to shore up the respect, or put it this, well, to the respect of people who may not be good at standardized tests, but who nonetheless make important contributions to not only the economy, but also to the common good more broadly conceived. By the way, just to understand that these ideas are not simply a good talk, it was the book of Professor Sandel that made a very strong impression on the current German Chancellor. And uh, he decided basically to structure the campaign of the Social Democrats on the last elections, very much according to this line, basically the fact that you don't have university education does not mean that you do not deserve and so on and so on. It worked well for him. I mean, on the elections. But, but, the real, but the real question for me still remains the following. Is this about education only? Because much early on in 60s and 70s, there was a book which probably many of you remember. Daniel Bell wrote this book on the cultural contradictions of capitalism. And he made a point which I found very relevant to your, uh, to your talk. He basically said, listen, the way we are valuing some people in the field of culture should not be the same in the field of economy, should not be basically in other fields. Is this not the problem that in a way success started much more to mean financial success? Uh, basically, yeah, normally you have all these great writers in 50s and 60s, which everybody knew that they're great writers, but they were not selling well. And it was even non-prestigious to sell well. Uh, there were some people, no, no, they, they, you know, in the 60s there was a subculture in which, uh, for example, there was a famous book, uh, Making It by Podhoretz back then, who said he was the first celebrating that somebody coming from counter, counterculture was published in the New Yorker and he liked it, because the idea was that there are certain different groups in which you are valued. Suddenly now, if you are great in something, you also should be rich. Uh, and to, uh, to say something uh, also because I, I don't have a good school story, but these few times in which I have been uh, walking around places like Harvard, one of the things that strikes you is how much people talk about money. Hmm. Listen, it's a great university, there's a lot of uh, talent and so on, but exactly because it is a talent, you, host, you also have the 1% of a star professors and also you have all these very gifted graduates which cannot get tenure and so on. I'm saying this because to what extent the fact that suddenly all these different spheres of life have been financialized, yeah. that allowed people to compare between fields that before were incomparable, yes. is not part of what we are facing. Yes, this I think goes beyond, I think this is a serious problem. It goes beyond meritocracy to the, to the companion of the meritocratic faith, which is the market faith, which was not only as it operated in the last 50 years. The market faith was not only that markets are the primary instruments for achieving uh, the public good, because they're efficient. The case for markets, the deep source of the market faith was, was not even mainly that markets deliver the goods and prosperity and affluence. Deeper still was the belief that markets provide a neutral way of deciding contested questions about value. 
what's valuable, what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. And this is closely bound up with a certain version of liberalism, which says, in pluralist societies, we disagree about values, about how to establish the value of this contribution that's against that contribution. And if we were to debate virtues and values and conceptions of the good life in public, we'll have hopeless disagreement and maybe even will have coercion with the majority imposing its view of the good life on others. So better to seek principles and mechanisms, well, principles of justice and mechanisms of allocation that spare us the need, us democratic citizens the need, to reason together and argue together in public about substantive moral ideals and values. This is the deep appeal of markets and it's bound up with the appeal of liberalism as neutrality. It's a false promise, it's a false promise because letting markets decide what social roles contribute the greatest value does not leave those questions undecided. It simply means that markets superintended typically by the wealthy and the powerful will decide those questions for us and will tell us that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good, which is untrue. But if I could, so I think it's the, the market faith that flattens all goods and modes of appreciation for a great novel or for a great work of culture into a single uniform measure of value. In that way, it's connected not with liberalism as such, but with a utilitarian idea, a Jeremy Bentham-like idea, that all goods in principle can be captured along a single uniform measure of value, which is then organized and fed into the market. And this, I think, it, another way of describing how this market faith took hold was that in the last 50 years, during the age of meritocracy, we also, at the same time, partly independently, shifted from having market economies to becoming market societies, by which I mean societies that flatten modes of valuation into a single uniform measure of value. Thank you very much. We have four minutes, so I kept the easiest question uh, for the end. And this is, imagine that in this room, you have all the decision makers in the world. And they're really ready to listen to you. And they agree with your major idea that, which I very much, that first there is a problem with meritocratic elites, not simply with the fact that meritocracy does not work, and that something should change. What would you ask them to change? Well, <clears throat> apart, <laughs> I would, I would ask them to change uh, two things. Well, first, I would go back to what we were discussing about education, and especially civic education, education for citizenship, for the cultivation of civic virtues beyond technocratic expertise. I would say in addition to investing more money and according more respect to technical and vocational training and the people who perform jobs that don't require a degree, we should not sequester moral and civic education in the citadel of higher education and then conduct a tournament to see who will have access to it, to say nothing of the jobs that go with the luster of those degrees. Moral and civic education, more broadly moral and political philosophy, should not be the province, the sole province of the credentialed. It should be diffused, that broad cultural learning 
in civic education should be diffused throughout the society, including in, in spaces and forums, in venues, outside universities. There's no reason why Plato and Aristotle and Rousseau and John Stuart Mill, just to take some example from the Western canon of moral and political philosophy, can only be taught to future hedge fund managers and management consultants. They're no more capable or attuned to reflecting on those enduring questions of justice and the common good and the good life than future plumbers and electricians and care workers. So I would, the first thing I would do would be to diffuse, to undertake a a civic project of diffusing uh, liberal arts learning broadly conceived and civic education in particular and moral and political reflection broadly throughout the society. One of the, these, these can be taught in, in community centers, in workplaces, in union halls, in congregations, throughout the civil society. And also on the internet where I've done some experiments trying to promulgate or make available, not promulgate really, to make available, to create free and open access to uh, my course in political philosophy at Harvard. And if I could just tell one story, it takes another minute from our time. You have it. The, we never imagined that when we did this experiment, before MOOCs and all of this stuff, um, that millions of people would want to watch lectures about philosophy. But one of the, the greatest reward that came to me was when a colleague of mine came back a few, some years ago from China and said he was in a taxi in Beijing. And the taxi driver asked him where he was from, and he said Massachusetts. He didn't say Harvard. And the taxi, Chinese taxi driver said, oh, I'm taking a course uh, on justice from a Harvard Professor, I'm taking it online, and my family is taking it with me. The taxi driver in Beijing. That made the, the entire effort worthwhile. But it also is in line with what my first proposal, which is broadly to diffuse and make available access to civic education and moral and political philosophy everywhere. The, one of my favorite examples, one of the strongest labor union organizations in the United States in the late 19th century was the Knights of Labor, they called themselves. And there they pressed, like all unions do, for better wages and shorter hours and safer working conditions, but one of their demands was reading rooms in factories so that on their breaks from work, industrial workers could read newspapers and periodicals and other relevant books and, and inform themselves about public affairs so that they could have a meaningful say in self-government. We don't think of unions as having that mission anymore, but that would be part of my proposal. That would be a small example. And it's related to the second proposal, which is, we've been talking about lofty terms of public discourse and turning, which I think we do need to turn, the focus of public discourse. But we need also to reimagine the civil society by creating within the civil society, within cities and towns and neighborhoods, arenas for class mixing that we currently lack. We need to try to reconstruct and reimagine public spaces and common spaces where citizens encounter one another in the course of the day. Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that people from different backgrounds encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of their everyday lives. Because this is how, this is how we learn to negotiate and to abide our differences. 
And in the end, this is how we come to care for the common good. It's a, it's a civic life, a class mixing civic life that recalls us in concrete ways to the possibility of, of a shared common life and a politics of the common good. Those are my two modest proposals, Yvonne, at, at least to begin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now when political leaders know what to do, we can go home. Thank you. <laughs>